Not every film can be understood the first time you watch it, and that fact makes it even more interesting. Are there any hidden details or secret meanings that you missed? And if so, are they able to completely change the meaning of what is happening? We suddenly found a crazy theory that radically changes the opinion about today's hero. It's hard to believe, but the arguments were convincing enough and we decided to share them with you. Today on About Movies channel, we'll tell you about a shocking and unobvious plot twist in Fight Club that you hardly noticed. But first, click on the subscribe button and bell to find out the most incredible things about the world of cinema that most don't know. The legendary film adaptation of Chuck Palahniuk's novel Fight Club left a deep impression on lots of viewers. It significantly influenced the pop culture of the early 2000s and became a cultural phenomenon. I didn't make a mistake. It's an adaptation, not just a screen version of the novel. Director David Fincher took the storyline, key characters, and most of the dialogue from the original as a basis, but then he presented the story through the prism of his own vision. This is clearly seen at the end of the film, but we'll return to this a bit later. Well, don't worry if you don't understand this theory because you didn't read the book. It's based entirely on the film, and you just need to remember the main characters and the general motive. We'll do the rest. David Fincher really did his best. The film has great character development, a powerful atmosphere that you feel through all visual details. If you look closely at the scenery, you understand that it's not only, and not just an addition, but reflection of the psychological state of the narrator. The most impressive part of the film is the twist with a second protagonist. Tyler Durden, who was charismatic and aggressive, turned out to not be a separate subject, but the protagonist's alter ego. The figment of the imagination lined with the life of the psyche. He was the epitome of masculinity, as a way to make up for his lack of it in the narrator, and we trace his role in the smallest details of the image. Whether it was Tyler's appearance, his defiant red wardrobe items, or impudent behavior, the second personality in the form of Tyler was both a friend and antagonist of the narrator. He was constantly trying to weave Jack into the mess, thereby allegedly growing his balls. And also, he was fighting with another alter ego of the narrator. Didn't expect this? Yes. If we look closely at all the details, we'll see that in the picture there are hints of another personality of Jack, a figment of his imagination. And this is Marla. There are several stage tricks by which we can suspect this. One of the key ones is the resemblance between Marla and Tyler. The director definitely plays with images, hinting that the two main antagonists are the same person. The first sign is a hairstyle, which is very similar for both characters up to the moment Tyler's secret is revealed. Their tastes and clothes are also very similar. Dark glasses, a fur coat, and rings. Both have a chaotic, tasseled look there's a feeling that each of them is dressed in the first thing that comes to their hand. In almost every scene of the film, both of them smoke, behave provocatively, like emphasizing the phlegmatic behavior of the narrator. However, Marla was the first who took possession of the main character. And this happened at a meeting of patients with testicular cancer, where the narrator met a girl. The situation, as it were, makes us understand that Jack was gradually losing his masculinity and Bob's sad story served as a definite confirmation of this. Being there, pressed against his tits, ready to cry, this was my vacation, Jack told us. By the way, it's interesting that in this scene there were balls in the background in a metal cage, hinting at what members of this group are deprived of. The attribute of female identity compared to biblical characters is a metaphor for gone masculinity, and the protagonist's comfort of this context explains what comes next. Talking about Marla, Jack seemed to be talking about himself. Her lie reflected my lie. After all, Jack, like Marla, was not sick. And he, like Marla, attended the same meetings. She took possession of him and his thoughts. He stopped getting what he wanted from attending these meetings and stopped sleeping again. Marla's strong connection with Jack can be seen in another of his lines. If I did have a tumor, I'd name it Marla. Remember the moment when the main character returned to the halls of his consciousness during meditation? He didn't see a penguin, which was already known to us. He saw Marla, and this is a clear hint that she was a second personality. After all, she was in the depths of his consciousness, knowing all his thoughts and desires. 
Moreover, he noticed her in the hall after their dialogue in his subconscious, as if she materialized from the fog. This is confirmed by the episode of the first conversation between Jack and Marla. I saw you, I saw you had melanoma, I saw you had tuberculosis, I saw you had testicular cancer. I saw you practicing this. Practicing what? Telling me off. Is it going as well as you hoped? Rupert. She knew that he had imagined this moment earlier since she was locked in his head and could see his thoughts. This is what explains her last sentence. In addition, Marla's amazing ability to walk along a busy highway was really alarming. Moreover, not a single car slowed down or honked. It seemed that no one even saw it except our hero. The girl became an important part of Jack's life, literally taking over his mind. She seemed to be everywhere. Want even more arguments? I'll provide them to you. In the meantime, write in the comments whether you like this film or not and why. The internal struggle of the protagonist between male and female, Jack's insecurity in his masculine manifestation is visible in another scene. After their meeting, an interesting dialogue of heroes took place. Testicular cancer should be no contest, I think. Well, right? technically, I have more of a right to be there than you. You still have your balls. I'm kidding. I don't know. In addition, as the story progressed, he became more and more visually similar to her, undergoing a transformation from masculine to feminine. A vivid manifestation of this is the situation in the laundry. Remember? Marla took a few pairs of jeans out of the dryer without looking and sold them at a local flea market. It was jeans that for a long time were considered a symbol of masculinity in America in the 90s. Just remember what the brutal bearded men of films of those times were wearing. On the dryer, we can see the inscription Speed Queen, which very symbolically conveys her role in the relationship with Jack. She thoroughly took control of the narrator and became the main alter ego. This culminated in the scene where Marla grabbed the main character by his testicles when he mentioned jeans and said imperiously, yes, I sell clothes. And she let him go when she saw he didn't resist her. And what was the chance that two adjacent dryers contained exclusively men's jeans? And how could Marla know that? It's logical to assume that Jack himself was selling his things in a commission shop, and this directorial passage represents the symbolic point of Marla's formation and Jack's farewell to his masculinity. We see something similar at the end of the film. Thanks to Tyler's skillful and subtle delivery, we see the reincarnation of the narrator in the scene about the police station. Jack's trousers were taken off. He lost the symbol of masculinity. And in the final chord of the picture, we see Jack and Marla standing side by side. In the frame, it seems that he was standing in a dress reflecting the visual image of Marla. Thus, the director deftly put an end to the history of Jack's reincarnation. He met the finale with the only person left with him. But back to another important detail. Later, after the laundry scene, Marla appeared before the narrator in a pink dress that she bought for just a dollar at the discount store. It was possible that she or Jack, in the form of Marla, acquired this dress in the same thrift store after he sold his own jeans. Moreover, when Jack entered the commission, we could notice a dress on the hanger that was very similar to what Marla would be wearing. And the girl seemed to be hinting at the real owner of the dress. She told Jack, you can borrow it sometime. But despite the efforts of the female alter ego, the masculine part began to predominate inside of Jack. So Tyler entered the scene. Their acquaintance initially hints that Tyler is just a figment of the narrator's imagination. What happened before they met? Jack was talking about his work to a woman with glasses, then was fantasizing about a plane crash, and suddenly Tyler appeared in the woman's place. It's likely that Jack boarded the plane as Marla. The tray from which the same woman eats also refers to her. Remember that Marla stole food on similar trays. But the woman couldn't disappear by herself. Accordingly, she was also a figment of Jack's imagination. So the imaginary catastrophe knocked out Marla's leading position in his subconscious and replaced it with a male alter ego. The narrator himself hinted at this, uttering the phrase, For a changeover. He flips the projectors, movie keeps right on going, and nobody in the audience has any idea. Changeover can be interpreted in the same way as change places. Another, his monologue is also interesting. You wake up at a different time, in a different place. Could you wake up as a different person? Have you noticed how the camera clearly focused on Tyler on the phrase, wake up a different person? 
We are led to similar thoughts by the situation with Jack's luggage upon arrival, which was suddenly and unexpectedly lost. But it's not the point that he doesn't find the luggage. We are clearly hinted that there are some kind of vibrating device in it. More specifically, a vibrator. The guard said that they weren't allowed to say your vibrator. This way, he made it clear that this thing definitely belonged to Jack. The director left us with hints of the change of Marla to Tyler, more and more focusing on the masculine principle. And the appearance of a rubber phallus wasn't the only situation. In the movie theater scene, Tyler inserted his penis into the film reel. A pull like this was important. He gave Jack his genitals back. Also, let's note that in the image of the emergency exit that was shown to us after Tyler entered Jack's life, we are shown a woman opening the exit, but a man exiting it. But Marla in Jack's head wasn't going to lose ground so easily. The constant struggle between the two alter egos can be traced throughout the film. She began to take on key positions again when she called to say that she was going to commit suicide. By the way, if you noticed, on the pills that she threw, there was an inscription, Xanax. At the beginning of the movie, we saw the doctor prescribe Tunal to Jack, and Tunal and Xanax are almost identical drugs. It is likely that the pharmacy did not have Tunal, and Jack took an analog, which he swallowed in the state of Marla. So, during Marla's call, we see Tyler yelling in the background as Jack said her name. <laughs> Sounds like fuck, doesn't it? The feminine was starting to dominate the narrator again, and Tyler didn't like it at all because he would have to fight for supremacy all the time. This explains Tyler's advice to stay away from Marla. They never appeared together in the same room, and when Marla showed up at the house, for the first time in two months, the door to Tyler's room was locked. The plot line is noteworthy. Marla reappeared in Jack's life. A bed scene with a girl followed, blurred and resembling Jack's sleepy delirium, and Tyler faded into the background. Initially, Jack clearly distributed his alter egos in different places of residence. Marla was living in a hotel. This was not told in any way, but it would later become clear if you paid attention to some frames. Interestingly, Jack allegedly didn't know where Marla was living even after visiting her room. As you remember, Jack himself also lived in hotels, so this image wasn't new to him. After his apartment was blown up, he chose the male lead Tyler in his subconscious, saying he's going to find a hotel. By the way, it's noteworthy that after their meeting, power again passed from Tyler to Marla at the moment when Jack handed him the beer. In the background of this scene, we see a neon sign of a phallic form, which faded at this moment. Tyler was living in a house on a certain paper street, but neither the house nor the street existed. Moreover, the very name Paper Street is interpreted as a street that is placed on the map, but which in reality was not built. Apparently, adding multiple personalities negatively affected Jack's psyche, because when Marla increasingly began to appear on Paper Street, he became annoyed and clearly became less stable. But in fact, both Marla and Tyler were living in the same place, where Jack was living. He subconsciously settled them in different places as a way to protect his psyche, and the place of residence of each alter ego was a kind of projection of the mental state of Jack himself. The situation changed when Marla tried to commit suicide. The two personalities clashed at a critical moment as Tyler was forced to save Jack in Marla's form. After all, he saved not only Jack, he saved himself. This explains two more interesting points. Why Marla called Tyler on a non-existent paper street because Jack gave her his number long before he met Tyler. And how did it happen that Tyler moved from Paper Street to Marla's room so quickly while she was counting to 10? Interestingly, the director connected Marla and Tyler in Jack's brain. There always were occasional parallels between them. For example, do you remember the same penis scene that Tyler inserted in the Cinderella movie? Later, Marla told Jack, the condom is the glass slipper of our generation, which is a pretty obvious Cinderella reference. A similar parallel occurred when Tyler saved Marla. When she saw the paramedics, she spoke as if referring to herself in the third person. She's infectious human weight! This phrase is surprising if you don't remember that it particularly describes the fat from which Jack and Tyler were making soap at night. More specifically, Jack himself did it using infectious human waste. We can know that from the emblem on the tank from which he extracted it. The problem escalated when all of Jack's personalities began to merge. 
he began to gradually go crazy, didn't see reality, and lost control over himself. Remember, one of the last fights of the Fight Club in which he finished the guy to a state in which medical attention was required. His fragile house of cards began to crumble. This is even visually duplicated in the scene of the explosion of high-rise buildings. Unable to retain all of his personalities, he finally renounced his masculinity by killing Tyler and became Marla. Notice this point. Here, Jack and Marla seem to mirror each other, being one and the same. Well, we have given arguments that, in our opinion, confirm this theory. What do you think? Are all three main characters really just parts of the same narrator personality? Write your opinion in the comments, and of course, leave a like. And if you like to learn about the details of films that most viewers didn't notice, then you can click on this icon. We talked about facts and references in the first Matrix that you might not have noticed all these years later. Follow the link and watch. It was about movies. See you very soon. Bye-bye.